Good morning, everyone. So I am Som Roy. I'm one of the radiation oncologists in Chicago, and I'm going to start as a physician scientist at University Hospital Sideman Cancer Center in Cleveland very soon. And today we have Dr. Michael Ong, who is the Associate Professor of um, Medicine at the University of Ottawa, the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center. And he also happens to be the chair of the triple switch trial in, in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Welcome, Dr. Ong. On Tuesday, you have presented the importance of PSA level of 0.2 in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer patients at six to 12 months after initiating ARPI therapy. Why don't you tell us more about your study and your findings and all the things? So our study was in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. We currently make a lot of decisions in the first six months of therapy. So we start patients on androgen deprivation therapy. We have consultations to decide whether patients have AR pathway inhibitors on top of that and whether or not patients have docetaxel chemotherapy. But still, uh, outcomes of patients are very heterogeneous. I mean, some patients actually don't need as much therapy and some patients, despite a lot of therapy, have poor outcomes. So what we really need, uh, wanted to do is study after we after those six months in the next six months what is the PSA outcome of these patients and can it inform us to either escalate therapy more or potentially de-escalate therapy more give us prognostic information so we can rationally uh, alter therapy at, at that time frame and what did you found yeah so we used uh, the Ironman registry the Ironman registry is an international real-world database and that has over 4,600 patients enrolled in 123 sites and 15 countries. Wow. So a very large real world database. Um, we, we really looked and pared down, as you know, to just patients with MHSBC treated with ADT and ARPI with or without docetaxel uh, as our cohort and with adequate PSA follow-up. And we, uh, it was a very international effort. So 56% of our population was from North America and 41% from Europe and 3% from Australia. We had some patients from uh, Africa, uh, Central America, South America. So really a big international effort. And like you, you might have noticed some like differences in PSA uh, sensitivity yeah. or maybe differences in some kind of outcome. So what were, what were your major findings from this? So, so first of all, as you know, we were really interested to know uh, not only if PSA over 0.2 is helpful in prognosticating patients, but whether if you have PSA of less than 0.02, uh, whether that could portend very good prognosis in real world data. But as you know, in the real world, uh, the limit of detection of labs for different countries, different sites, even within the same site, uh, is, is highly variable. When we looked at the limited detection, we actually found that that was variable, and that's actually in a very important finding yep. uh, to know that if we were thinking about de-escalation trials, actually a lot of labs don't even test that low. So we couldn't even think about de-escalating patients if you know if your if your PSA only gets as low as 0.2, then you can't know that someone has a better prognosis at 0.02. And that is so important because most of the most of the times we see these data from the trials that mm. might not be reflective of the real world population. There is a huge limitation in the real world population outside the clinical trials, and that's where this kind of study is so important. So yeah. that is. That is fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. so some of the key findings, at six months, about half of patients have PSA over 0.2. And at 12 months, a third of patients have PSA over 0.2. Now, when you look at that 12-month landmark, patients are doing very poorly. Their median survival is 29 months. Their three-year survival is 45%. Um, and that's to be contrasted with PSA less than 0.1. Patients have a three-year survival of 84%. This was consistent in, in the six and 12 month analyses, but also in multivariable analyses. We looked at all the, these prognostic factors and found that there's a five-fold uh, worse mortality for patients with a PSA of over 0.2 at 12 months. That is very important. So a, a five-fold increase in mortality for patients who have a PSA of 0.2 or higher at six to 12 months, that's a very important key finding from this study. 
So what do you think is the implication of this finding, this five-fold increase in mortality in our practice? I think what we can take right now is that that, though that PSA absolute value is prognostic. We know that from post hoc analyses of randomized data, now we know it from real world data. Uh, as what we can actually action, I think there are now a new generation of clinical trials looking at this six to 12 month time period, right? So I'm the chair of a cooperative group uh, clinical trial led by the Canadian Cancer Trials Group and SWOG. So it's a United States and Canada um, study. We look at patients getting ADT and ARPI and if their PSA is still 0.2, we know their prognosis is worse, we randomize patients to the addition of docetaxel chemotherapy with overall survival as the primary objective. And from studies like this, we hope to know, okay, what is the, you know, how much value is uh, docetaxel bringing on top of uh, the situation? What's also interesting in this trial is we're not just picking high volume patients, we're picking patients with any volume or risk but you can see that the PSA is still about 0.2, saying biologically there may be evidence of castration, like early castration resistant clones present, that we should tackle that, that early rather than waiting for uh, patients to actually progress. That is amazing, and that would help many, many patients in the future. And what do you think also, suppose if someone has a PSA of 0.2 or lower than that, or maybe less than 0.1 at six to 12 months, do you think there's a potential role for de-escalating the treatment for those patients? Yeah, so this is such an interesting question. I mean, I think uh, when you know uh, this group is doing prognostically well, first of all, it took us a long time to discover all these uh, amazing AR pathway inhibitors that work and extend life. So is it safe to actually stop anything in that situation where a patient's doing well? I think we, you know, in my own clinic, of course, I've had patients that have only gotten androgen deprivation therapy, and after 10 years of treatment, they have still never progressed. So that kind of information tells me that there probably is a role of de-escalation in patients doing well. And why would we do that? We would do it because uh, patients' quality of life could be benefited. I think this is a very important point. Could be benefited by um, you know, perhaps increased energy, increased muscle mass, increased uh, uh, sexual function. These are very important uh, aspects to patients to even consider de-escalation. Um, and we need to look at, well, how then would we de-escalate? We know the Europeans have started a phase three study of de-escalation uh, where they'll uh, randomize patients to do intermittent uh, androgen uh, uh, deprivation therapy plus AR pathway inhibitor uh, versus continuous. Uh, so that's one approach. There are also ideas out there where we could potentially uh, continue AR pathway inhibitor alone with stopping ADT. There are some potential issues of, with that, of course, of estrogen excess and you know needing to intervene in other ways to manage that. Yeah, you might so, need us to intervene to do the treatment for radiation treatment for gynecomastia at that point in time. Yeah. And we are stopping one treatment and then yeah. adding another. So that kind of remains, there is still kind of an equipoise there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. but yeah, overall, this is an excellent finding. And I think it would help many, many patients over the coming decade or so. And hopefully your triple switch trial will change practice.